Hello there. I'm here to show you a wonderful place. A veritable Camelot of the nuclear age. Not made by God Almighty, but the working man. You can be a hero by purchasing a residence in a vault tech vault today. Because if the worst should happen tomorrow, the world is going to need you to build a better day after. Hey everybody, Eric Schweitzer here for The Gamer. Today we're talking about Amazon's Fallout, and I'm joined by the vault girl herself, Rihanna Bevan. Howdy, howdy. Um, I thought that this show was so much better than I thought it was going to be. It was so much better than the trailers. It was better than I think everyone was anticipating. It was it, it was just very good. Yeah. Um where to begin? I think I, let's start with the cast cuz I think I thought I think the cast was pretty much perfect. Um Walton Goggins is our main sort of in the past and the future. The show has has two timelines and plays the same character, but in two very di- different ways. Uh, and I've always really liked him. I really liked him in Vice Principles and all that HBO stuff. And I thought he just like killed it in this one. No, he absolutely does. I mean, he kills it in like everything he's in. So I wasn't too surprised with that. But the casting, like you said, was just perfect. He was the perfect sort of um, all American guy in the in the past, and he was the perfect ghoul as well. So he had he had a lot to carry, and he absolutely carried it flawlessly, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, uh, I was writing something about his character, about the way like th- throughout the the sort of pre-apocalypse timeline, his his journey of deprogramming, his sort of slow realization that like the world is pretty wrong. It shouldn't be this way. Uh, I thought it was handled so well because he's he starts out as he he's an actor, he's a veteran and he has a really cushy life and he thinks that things are pretty good and, and all of the problems around him don't really affect him because he's in a class above it. Uh, but then slowly starts to become pretty disillusioned uh, until let's maybe let's not go straight into <laughs> a- end of the season spoilers right at the start here. But uh, he has a really cool transformation that, that, you know, mirrors his physical transformation when he becomes a ghoul in the, in the post apocalypse. Yeah, that's the perfect summary of it. And um, again, without getting into spoilers, I think his pre-apocalypse story is uh, probably my favorite of the show. Um, And it's also very unexpected. I will also say very unexpected for an Amazon, uh, or at least a a show that is on an Amazon-owned platform. Um, Again, without getting into spoiler territory, it, it understands, and this is the most important thing about the show, consistently it understands the the intent of the games the themes of the games yes uh, even if it's not ad- and i think that that's extra because it's not adapting a story that we've ever seen before especially for like pre-apocalypse we don't get any pre-apocalypse stories in fallout so yes. to do that and then to carry it so effortlessly with an amazing cast and a really nice uh, sort of deprogramming story from uh you know 1940s-esque america mm-hmm. um is is one of its strengths and i feel like that consistently is one of its strengths in how it, it 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 brings something new to the table with everything it does yeah yeah you're totally right it it it's it, it nails the visual aesthetic of fallout like it has all the iconography that you would expect but it also hits on the all of its themes too um and it hits on them harder than the game does because tv has to be for Every audience has nothing can be ambiguous in TV <laughs> these days, right? Everything has to be as on the nose as possible. And I think that the show is very on the nose with what it's about. Um, but because it's because it's a, a satire, it, it works. Um, let's talk about uh, Ella Purnell's Lucy, who is your quintessential fish out of water, uh, a very naive vault dweller. But but plays it in a way that like has a lot of nuance and isn't just like a one note sort of I'm lost, confused girl thing. Right. Like I thought her character was great. She was my favorite character in the entire show from the very first episode to the final episode. And that is because 
I, I, on the one hand, she reminds me of like the characters I make where they um, like going for a charisma build, but not pulling it off well at all. Like she's failing every single speech check. You can see it in real time. It's fantastic. Uh, her, <laughs> has, her lines are hilarious. Her, um, her Ella Pennell's, um delivery is hilarious throughout. She carried it for me. Um, like at first she is like very much an archetype, um, especially in the first episode. There's a lot of like jokes about her naivety and um some jokes I wasn't expecting in the first episode people see mm-hmm. I think what I mean uh um with that but she definitely comes into her own towards the end and is a more fully realized fleshed out character at that point and one that I'm really looking forward to sort of um carrying the series going forward because we now there's, we now know there's already probably gonna be a season two so I'm really yeah. looking forward to that as well it's not easy and it's credit to the writing too because like you know fallout is has silent protagonists for the most part i know four was a little bit different um but you you the the characters in fallout are great but it's all the people that surround you and you're just like this blank slate player insert so to take to to create someone to be the vault dweller and try to figure out who that person is and what it what it who a vault dweller should be. Um, I just thought it was like, it, it was so well ha- handled. She's so much more uh, like dynamic uh, than, than you would expect the, the player character character to be. Yeah. That was my biggest fear going into it. Um, looking at the trailer, I, I think the worst thing she could have been and the worst thing the show could have been on the whole was boring. Um, and you definitely can't accuse her of being boring. Um, I think it was a very good decision to make her not, um, kind of like uh, she failed upwards a lot not even failed upwards sometimes she's just failing downwards and i think that was oh, yeah. really fun to see um she's not as competent as some players would be as well which i felt was really good because a part of the experience of fallout is everyone failing in this absolutely horrific world um but yeah i, I i'm really glad they took the direction of not making her a blank slate for people to um you know project themselves onto because the show I mean, if there is someone for that, maybe it's um, the ghoul pre-apocalypse. Um, maybe not completely, but you know. Um, but the show doesn't really need that because this is a weird and wonderful world and there shouldn't be any sort of, you know, the, the grounding is in when we slowly realize the parallels it has of our real world. Like that is mm-hmm. the moments where it kind of hits home. We don't need um, a sort of straight man to carry the show like at all. We don't need someone to just um, be a blank slate and right. we don't have that. And I'm, I'm glad we don't. Yeah. And then the third prong uh, of our, our lead cast is uh, Maximus, uh, Aaron Moten, who was it was really interesting character because he's the one that's that really gets revealed throughout the season. Um, at, at first, I was not connecting with this character at all. He just seemed like kind of a coward uh, kind. Of, he didn't speak much at all. He just kind of let things happen to him. Uh, but then once he once he gets some agency a few episodes in, he's actually the most hilarious character in the season. Oh, by far, by far, especially towards the end. I was actually physically laughing out loud at some of the stuff he said. Him and Lucy as well. They're amazing paired up together. Yeah, there's a really funny the, the two of them together are really funny because they're naive in opposite ways. And so it's like. Lucy doesn't understand the world and he understands it too much. Like he takes this crazy world for granted. Uh, And so you see this, like the way that they come at fallout from two different directions is really funny. Um, Yeah, completely agreed. Um, But I think I I was torn on him at first as well. Um, And I was like, okay, he's kind of like the weakest link here. Like, you know, from the first episode I was, not enjoying his scenes the most so i was kind of wanting to get back to the vault stuff but as you said he reveals himself as the show goes on um especially when he gets that agency then you really start to see his character uh, show um but i i really like is it's a real inversion of what we've seen from the brotherhood of steel in the Bethesda games um you know he he's so eager to be this like heroic knight that we saw especially in fallout 3 um but he he really only cares and the brotherhood as a whole really only really care about the aesthetics of it they don't care yeah. about like the actual doing of it part um and that i found that really compelling and i'm i was relieved that they took that um route with it i, I think that's gonna be kind of controversial with fans but i think to me the that's the, the best the brotherhood is you know when they are incredibly 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 flawed and not just 
there to be like the wasteland cops although they are the wasteland cops but like for bad reasons i don't mean that right yeah you're totally right it does it nails exactly what's interesting about the brotherhood and and that's that their aesthetic is one of incredible power but then when you figure out who who these people really are it's the it's all a veneer um and and yeah and i and maximus almost has a uh maximus almost has like a thin arc too because he's like all he's ever known i i mean he he was a child of a uh, disaster which which we can get into but then he's brought up by the brotherhood and all he's ever known is like wanting to be this like perfect soldier and then like immediately getting ripped up ripped away from that and having to decide what his own path is going to be um yeah he has a really cool arc he does um and it really ties into the other two's really nicely i think a big theme of everyone's arc here is kind of like cult deprogramming um and all three of them have had stuff hidden from them in different ways or at least like in the case of the ghoul um slash howard cooper i believe his name is like yeah yeah um in the case of um howard cooper's case that he that happens pre-war you know by the time of the war happening like he's gone through it as well he's he's grizzled at this point um but lucy and maximus are going through that throughout the show um and i think it's such an interesting thing to to focus on because it really isn't afraid. It doesn't pull its punches with its criticism of American culture. And it does that through different ways, three different ways. In fact, um, through each character. Yeah. Um, and I, I really hope fans pick up on that because I feel like um, a lot of them are going to get caught up on sort of smaller details. Go like, Oh, this armor doesn't look quite right. Or no, this mm. isn't how this looks, you know, but I feel like that's less important when through Maximus Stark, especially like we, we're getting a deconstruction and a real understanding of what fallout is meant to be about. Mm -hmm. yeah well and then the dynamic between lucy and the ghoul is interesting too because they have this tug of war of hope and hopelessness right Mm. the ghoul is trying to turn lucy and lucy's trying to turn the ghoul back and so they're like and by the end of the season it really feels like the the ghoul has pulled lucy in um because it i mean after everything she goes through in this show, it's pretty hard to see any any light at the end of the tunnel, right? It's pretty much we're on the dark side now, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not just even a case of like, oh, vault life wasn't all it was cracked up to be. It's like literally everything she's ever known has been thrown away and stomped on and then given back to her and then thrown away again. It's it's absolutely brutal. Um, yeah. Both physically in terms of what she goes through, but like emotionally, mentally, it's... It's a lot. I I wasn't expecting it to go as hard as it did, um, but it did. Um, Yeah, so that's a big, you're right, very interesting tug of war and probably one that's going to continue. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the story because, you know, it's at at its core, it's a MacGuffin story um, about a bunch of people chasing after an object of power. And I think it's there's some complexity in that we have two timelines. Um, but it is a pretty simple story of like, it's a, it's a road movie and it's a bunch of people going after the same thing, but that's, it seems to me that that was kind of a perfect way to make this first season all about the world. And that by putting people on this like long journey across the wasteland, we really get to showcase all the different pieces of fallout. No, you're absolutely right. Um, it, it covers a wide area, uh, both in terms of like the lore it's diving into, but also like location wise, we're going around everywhere. And that is because, yeah, a lot of it is, especially the first half of the season is setting up the world of fallout um, for the benefit of people that haven't played the games. I can definitely see people that haven't played the games being able to perfectly enjoy this fine. It, yes. it doesn't introduce you to the entirety of the law, but it, it tells you the bits that you would need to understand. Even as someone who already knew it, it's, it's fun seeing it, you know, realized in live action. Um, so I agree. Um, I think it is a MacGuffin story and especially it's the first half. I do feel like this sort of, when it gets to the halfway point and it, you realize this is about things outside of that as well. It does. The detour is, it's great. I love the detour. It doesn't feel as natural as the first half. I'd say, um, I it's sort of, yeah. Um, so I like what they do. I don't necessarily like how they get there. Um, 
I feel like it could have benefited from a few more episodes, quite frankly. I mean, I wasn't ready to put it down, so maybe I just wanted more. But I do feel mm-hmm. like it wanted more breathing room to set things up before we started getting the character arcs really moving. I remember getting to episode seven and thinking, how are they going to wrap this up so quickly? Yeah. Yeah, I guess it, if I do have a couple points of criticism, one is is actually the two things you just mentioned. The <laughs> the I, I, I think it's Vault 8. Yeah. I want to yeah. say. There, there is a two episode, but it kind of bleeds into three episode that is all takes place within a vault that Lucy and Maximus stumble upon. And what's cool about that is, is that that is a, a, a tie into the games, right? Like you, a big part of the games is stumbling into a vault and then slowly uncovering what kind of weird crap was going on there. Uh, and the, the show does that, but it's also like it's eight episodes and more than two of them are just what's going on in this vault. Um, and, th- and that story does connect to, it connects to Maximus's arc, uh, in an important way. And it's also important for Lucy's deprogramming arc, but it is, uh, a big percent of the show dedicated to that. And then the other thing that you mentioned is just that, this is a it's a bit of a puzzle box show in that it sets up some big questions in the first episode and then really teases those out for the whole season. And then in the last episode, it's just like, here's everything. There's like big, long exposition dumps in that last episode where like really crazy stuff happens. Yeah, um, that's kind of. Again, the final episode, I'm not going to spoil anything of what happens, but big stuff happens, big implications for the world at large, big implications for the games going forward. And it it just happens very quickly, very, very mm-hmm. quickly when we're, when we're already rushing to the clock to finish up people's character arcs. Um, so again, it's not a case I have, even though these are changes that will probably be quite controversial, I have got no problem with them. I've I, I, at first I was like, Ooh. but then you know I, I thought about it. I was like, makes sense. But I do feel like it could have been told in a stronger way. It, it needed that breathing room. You know, we really needed to appreciate the gravity of what's being told to us because then also the gravity of like the conclusion to what happens with the MacGuffin. Like that's big as well and really yeah. like emotional, and it, it's kind of muddied in these exposition dumps like you said um it's 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 the pieces are all there and maybe it it will benefit when we get the whole next season to really explore everything that we've just seen but it's it's a lot to shove in at once and i feel like a lot of that is because we had that multi-season arc in the vault um i remember when we got to like the midway point of the multi-season arc i was thinking like i was like of the uh, multi-vault arc um Episode, yeah yes um i was thinking this feels like a monster of the week show at this point you know i, I feel mm. like i could i'm watching like a like a a series with like 20 episodes a season where they just go into a different vault every week and see what shenanigans <laughs> are going on there because yeah. it really the action really is just brought to a stop for that and i i have no complaints about that because i really like those episodes but it is just it was a bit much for how much they then had to fit in at the, at the end. So that, that would be my complaint there. And I feel like it doesn't use what it does to the best of its abilities. If that makes sense. Yeah. I, yeah. It, it does feel like eight episodes was not enough for everything they wanted to do in this first season. And I, I know we don't want to like spoil the end here. Cause the show just came out. Uh, so I, I would have to talk around it a little bit, but the show it makes a major departure from the games in the end, a, a very major one. And um, and on the one hand, I have mixed feelings about that. On the one hand, it does feel like the TV adaptations, like the movie versions of games have to, are like a little too fixated on going bigger. I don't know if bigger is the right word, but like making things more important. I, it just feels like it, it. There was some implicit thing about this is the show version, so we have to like things have to be more important. Um, but then on the other hand, I I do appreciate the show really telling its own story and sort of 
planting its own flag in, in the fallout mythos. And I think it does some really cool things with that. Like, for example, there's for the most part, nothing in the show uh, is, is from the games in terms of like characters and story. And like, yeah, we have B- Blamco Mac and cheese, right? Like we have Nuka Cola. It's like all the iconography is there. We've got Mr. Handy, all that stuff, but we don't go to uh, like Liberty prime doesn't show up. Like we don't go, you know, we, Spoiler, we don't uh, no Liberty prime. Yeah. Like Nick Valentine doesn't have a cameo. Like they don't do any of that stuff except that um, shady, Shady Shady Springs, Shady Sands, except that Shady Sands is like a key part of the story, except that in the game, Shady Sands is like a capital city. And on the show, it's a crater (laughs) where a city used to be. And it really feels like there's like they're saying this is our fallout. You know, like when you when you take an important location like that and blow it up, it, it feels like you're making a statement. Yeah, I've got feelings about that because that immediately made me feel like because I mean Shady Sands is an area that is somewhat mentioned in New Vegas. Um, it's a location in Fallout One and Two, and mm. to just blow it up uh, when it's mentioned in New Vegas is not being blown up um, it makes me kind of like mm, you know I was like feeling it. Yeah, you know, that's when my my fangirl instincts were stick were kind of starting to kick <laughs> right. in. Um, I don't. I, I like the uh, meaning behind it all. I love that it does with it as a story. So that kind of makes me forget any hangups about like the dates and maybe. But like it, I'm like again, can't get into spoilers. If the show very much respects the classic Fallout's and especially New Vegas because that seems to be what it's drawing upon the most when it comes to its themes, when it comes to even like references and stuff. It it really seems to love those games. So to then do something where like. It, like why is no one in new vegas mentioning that like this huge location is just a crater now you know um right well that it, that's so it deliberate because they like that's it, they needed a city that was a crater and they could have named it anything but the fact that they named it shady sands i think is like a real statement of like yes you know the games and we love the games too but this is our own story but this is going to yeah. fit into the the game mythos now. Like this is part of the law. It's it just seems like okay, it's now part of the law that this place is blown up. And I guess no one in New Vegas felt like mentioning that. <laughs> you know, well, um, is it is this supposed to be canonical with the games? Yeah. No, oh, I, really? I, yeah. That's that's kind of what made me like, oh wow, you know. Oh, I did not know that. So, because immediately when we find out about Shady Sands, I was looking at the timeline. And I was like. This is a bit weird, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, oh, that changes a lot of what I think of this show. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize I mean, that they were treating it as canon. Yes, uh, Todd Howard said we view what's happening in the show as canon. That's crazy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. I I have to think about some things again because I didn't realize that because it uh, it makes some big some big things happen here, and if that's supposed to be canon with the games, I yeah. That, that gives me a lot of yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's okay. exactly how I felt. Like when I realized that getting towards the final episode, I was like, okay, well, you've just kind of overwritten a lot, but whatever. I'm here for the ride. I like what they're doing. Yeah. I'll, I'll let them cook. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about how it like brings elements from the games in. Um, so like, for instance, like we have the the wildlife stuff, and there isn't a mm-hmm. lot of it. There's rad roaches show up quite a few times, uh, and they're as disgusting as you would think they would be. Um, mm-hmm. And then we get the bear, the yaguais, 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 uh, which was very cool. But they hold a lot back, and one of the big like wildlife moments is a totally new type of monster. It's like a it's like an axolotl, like a mutated yeah. axolotl well, kind of. The, well, they okay, they're in. Okay, I think like do they call them gulpers? They look nothing so like the gulpers in the game. They don't yeah. look like gulpers. Yeah, no, gulpers are more like frogs. Yeah, they're like they're smoother. I thought they looked different. I know that people have said they might be gulpers, and maybe they are. 
but they look way different. They look completely different, and I'm kind of glad for it because they looked horrific in the show. Yeah. I thought, so that's like an underwater creature that they're fighting. And I thought for sure that was going to be some kind of mire lurk. Yeah. Some kind of crustaceous thing, uh, which we don't see. Uh, and there's a lot of, there. boy, there's a lot of monsters that we do not see in this show. And it feels like there's a lot of stuff they're holding back. Um, there is a tease for Death Claws, but we don't see any. Um, there's no super mutants. There's no synths. I thought that was. Yes, there are no synths. Oh, that's just there's me. no synths. Yeah. So there's like really big core component. I mean, super mutants are like, they've been in every Fallout game. That That's a, yeah. that's a very important part of the lore and they don't show up. There's one guy in the pre-apocalypse timeline that makes a joke about super mutants, but that's it. Um, so it, it feels like, like when you're when I was watching the show, every episode was so packed with Fallout iconography. Like every scene, it felt like they were trying to jam in, you know, like the the junket gun. Is that what it's called? That like fires yeah. teeth like they got that in there. They got Mr. Handy in there. Like um, e- everything is so perfect. But then when I sat back and thought about it, there's so much left to cover in in Fallout lore. I almost respect them holding off and stuff like Death Claws, especially because like that's the one everyone expects. And if they haven't used it, then I I trust they had their reasons for that. Maybe those reasons are just budgetary, like because I know they did a lot a lot of practical effects in this. And maybe the gulper that isn't a gulper took up a, a lot of that <laughs> of their time and resources because <laughs> yeah. I can imagine it did. <laughs> yeah. Um okay, I think like I want to take the last few minutes here and dig into that last episode just because there's so much to talk about. Uh, Mm -hmm. So this, this will be our like spoiler part now. Right. Uh, Okay. Thank God. I can't wait to say, (laughs) I can't wait to get this off my chest. (laughs) Okay. So uh, let's sort of go in order of like the big hits. Right. So I think like, Maybe the first thing is the reveal that Vault Tech dropped the bombs. And the way yes. that's revealed is in the most arch, cartoonishly <laughs> evil, like, <laughs> like a bunch of billionaires sitting around a conference table talking about how much money they can make by ending the world in the most uncertain turn. Uh, the the least uncertain terms of all time like literally saying like there sure is a lot of profit to be made in ending the world like almost looking at the camera and winking about how evil they are and you know what it kind of works like i rewatched it a couple times for stuff i was writing and eventually it got i started rolling my eyes at like (laughs) we're gonna create a, a perfect monopoly like that it is so evil it is so insanely it is. evil it, and it already was even before the reveal they're like because yeah. it, it, it also reveals how the different vault tech experiments came about which has been a question for a while because we're not sure why vault tech just decided oh in this vault let's put like one person and a hundred puppets that's in this world let's have everyone called yeah. gary you know like it, it kind of reveals right. <laughs> why and how these came about and it's just these billionaires spitballing like different experiments they could do um and then i one of the characters i believe mr house from new vegas um says like oh well, this is a lot of money to put on something that you know might not happen <laughs> and then it's like you mm. said it's the really cartoony vault tech representative is like we're just gonna do it <laughs> right um and i immediately hated that but then i rewatched it and then i was like maybe I don't hate this. Maybe this is just like the logical conclusion for like the series and the law and where this has all been leading to. Maybe that, maybe that's just how it, it, it was. It definitely has been leading there. At least on, I mean, on the show, like when you look at um, like uh, every interaction that Cooper has is people telling him the end of the world is coming and people are going to make a bunch of money off of it. 
you know, <laughs> like he meets he he meets with um, Matt Barry, who's like a fellow actor. And he's like, Hollywood's dead, my boy. Everything is product now. <laughs> I'm product. You're product. The end of the world is product. You know, like everything is very on the nose. And then he meets with uh, a fellow actor who's like in this extremist resistance group who's trying to tell him about the fiduciary responsibility and how vault tech has to make the end of the world happen. So like, it's all, it's, it's not even that big of a reveal. Cause all these people through the whole show are saying, I think vault tech's trying to end the world. And then the big twist at the end is vault tech ended the world, but yeah, but it's still, it's played as a reveal and it is very, it's a, <laughs> it is a very evil scene. Um, I think yeah. I, why I'm split on it is because I thought one of the things I always loved about the Fallout law is you never find out who dropped the bombs and that kind of felt like the point because by the time you get to the point 200 years in the future when everything's in the radiated wasteland it doesn't matter who dropped the bombs all that matters right. is that someone did and another side re- retaliated it doesn't matter who did them first they both egged on each other with a nuclear arms race that destroyed humanity you know at right. that point it, it yeah and that kind of in, at, for, to initially I feel like you're really taking away that beautiful story that morbidly beautiful story about like the logical conclusion of a nuclear arms race however I still I don't think it completely takes it away because I mean the US is still complicit in this because throughout the show we find out they were just giving power and resources to vault you know vault only had um could only exist because of the of the nuclear panic that the US and um in in universe China created yeah. Um. They feed off that hysteria. They feed off that need for like a want for security. Um. And this like longing to preserve America because that's the only country that deserves to be preserved. You know, in in their minds. So it doesn't take away culpability from the nuclear states in the world, but it does put a lot more on old tech because it turns out they literally it isn't like even metaphorically they dropped the bombs because they were getting in the way of peace talks or they were getting in the way of a more sustainable source of energy that didn't rely on nuclear power. No, they they literally just did it, <laughs> you yeah. know, um, and uh, I'm not I, I, I'm not sure how I feel about that for the grander you know um plot but of the games of the universe but I'm, I'm willing to let them cook you know i trust this show to do something with it yeah i would feel a lot less mixed about it i i felt a lot less mixed about it before i learned that this is all canon to the games <laughs> <laughs> now i'm not sure about that choice but um so then the next big reveal is that all of those vault tech people are still alive in a sort of horizon zero dawn twist, the, the schemers that ended the world have also managed to live into the apocalypse, which is where like the sort of plausibility of all this, it, you know, you have to just sort of accept that, that they are so evil that they would rather live in an apocalypse and, and I don't know, like have this singular monopoly, even though, there's nothing to, you know, they all live in mansions and, and throw parties around their private pools. And, but they would rather like live in a ghoul infested apocalypse. Like that's better. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so they, not only are they, have they all cryoed themselves and they've lived into this, uh, dark future, but, um, Kyle McLaughlin's character, the, the overseer of, of um of lucy's vault was one of them but when we meet him he was like a personal assistant of the ghoul's wife who was sort of turned out to be the architect of this whole thing um and so yeah and so this whole through the whole season you think lucy's going to save her dad who's been kidnapped but it turns out that the person who kidnapped him was actually was also alive in the before times, right? Somehow. Yes. Um, God, there's a I, lot that, yeah. Go ahead. I was watching this with my partner and we were trying to figure out like, did they explain how she was, was alive still? I mean, I'm going guessing she just cried herself somehow. Maybe the resistance cell had their own cryotechnology. I mean, she's a scientist, so maybe. Um, like I said, yeah. there's a, not enough time to explore the implications of everything they show on screen in that episode. Right. 
Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if I needed all of the people we meet in the before times to come back later on. Like I, at first I thought it was weird that even the ghoul is still around. Like I know ghouls can live for a really long time, but this is, this is hundreds of years later. Right. Yeah. Um, so, but I was like, okay, star power, Walt and Goggins, they'll make it, they'll make it work. But then we find out like all of the people in the before time storyline are going to show up now in the apocalypse. And, uh, 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 I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah, no, I agree. It's, it's, it's a, it's a bit overkill. Um, I'm fine with some of them because I mean, vault is evil. Of course they found ways to live forever. Even if living forever means not even living at that point. Um, but then the implication that the ghoul is going to find his like wife and kid as well is just kind yeah. of perhaps a bit overkill because I feel like the whole point is that he doesn't have that life anymore. You know, right. he's lived like 200 years without it, you know. Um, so it just feels weird to just sort of bring him back to the beginning there. But we'll see. Yeah. Uh, and then the MacGuffin that they have been chasing this whole season, it turns out to be cold fusion power, um, which is interesting in that if the, if that this is a canon storyline that now this, this cold fusion, this little tiny thing that fits in the back of your neck exists in the world and can power the entire wasteland in with infinite power, like Power and who has control over it is a big theme, especially in three, but it's a big theme in all of them. Um, and it's not a like it's it's not a simple or renewable or infinite thing, but now it kind of is. Like this sort of this exists now. Yeah. Um that's gonna have huge implications because I mean I think it, the way it's presented at the end like you know they get it to work but then the people who would benefit from it can't benefit from it anymore um tells me that it's not going to go in a very positive direction it's now under control from the brotherhood of steel who have shown themselves to be just laughably either incompetent or just evil um you know in how they throw their weight around the wasteland so it's not in trusted hands right now I'll be interested to see how that goes. But like you said, it's, if, if it's infinite, then why is the Brotherhood going to... How is the Brotherhood going to hoard it to themselves? But I'm I'm sure that will probably be a big thing going forward. Yeah, and it, but it does feel inevitable that it will get destroyed. It feels like yeah. that's, a, that's something that needs to get taken off the table before the show ends. Because it's just too powerful. No, I or agree. Not- or either it's somewhat limited in its scope, maybe, is the only way they can get dance around that. Yeah. But- yeah. Um, and then finally, we end with a reveal of New Vegas, which is very exciting. I was pumping my fist. I was high-fiving a million <laughs> angels. I, I mean, f- that's the ultimate fan service, I think, is like showing the strip at the end there. Um, how cool is that? It was so fan servicey, but I was so here for it. Like, I was like this is this is i don't i try and like not be a complete fan girl but it was it was physically impossible for me to not like get up and cheer and like scream as soon as i saw that um i couldn't believe my eyes and i'm so happy that's and that's of course like that goes back to what i was saying earlier about how this game clearly so the show clearly has so much respect for new vegas otherwise why would they do that why would they end on that why would they yeah. take me taking us there and the you know in the in the future storylines so I'm so excited to see what happens. It's so silly how we see it, though. <laughs> it's so silly <laughs> yeah. um, with uh, Karl McLaughlin's character there. Um, but I, I'm so ready for it. I, I can't wait. <laughs> so do you know where in the timeline this this lands? Is this before the game or after the game? After, I believe. After. Okay. Um, okay. Which so th- is going to be pretty big. So because obviously anything could have happened there since we played the game there. Right. Yeah. So if, if this is after the game, then we, they don't have to deal with Benny and Mr. House. And, um, but like the way that game ends is, is up to you. Right. So like Caesar could still be around. Right. So I think how it ends is, I think no matter what ending you go with, 
stuff isn't I think the, a big theme of that game is nothing is really built to last in the wasteland um, as much as people want it to like you know obviously mm-hmm. all the factions are people trying to restore an image of the past that they like but none of them really take none of them are taking root so I think I can see an argument for just none of the sides winning in, in the show yeah. um, and that just that's still being compliant with whatever ending people went for um, obviously it would be a bit weird if like the Legion took over the wasteland for I don't know three years and then no one brings it up like a decade later but you yeah. know um, it would be interesting to dance around that especially when we've already seen Mr. House in the show and then to not have him be brought up again because obviously he can his story can end in different ways in the game yeah Yeah, so tell me about that which character is supposed to be mr house because i that totally went over my head he i mean like i think no he was credited as that in the credits so it definitely was meant to be him um he was the robco representative in the scene where they're discussing what to do with the vaults okay he okay, doesn't sound cool. or look anything like Mr. House, so that's where. Because <laughs> yeah. um, I'm sadly Mr. House's voice actor, um, name escapes right now. Is he passed away? Um, very okay. iconic voice. Um, but yeah, they, so they they can't get him. Um, so they opted to get someone who doesn't look or sound anything like him, which is a decision. <laughs> but um, I kind of was like, mm, could it? Because he made a reference to casinos, and I was like, that's probably meant to be him, right? Um, mm. And then yeah, in the credits, he's credited as. as um, even Mr. House or Robert House, I forget which one. Interesting. Well, we know, I think it's pretty clear that we're not done with the flashbacks because where the season ends, we, we have Cooper just for the first time learning the truth about who his wife is and what vault is doing. But when the season starts, they are separated. He's not an actor anymore. He's doing birthday parties with his daughter. Um, So we have to close that gap in season two, I think, um, which also leaves room for more Mr. House stuff, house stuff in the past, maybe. Um, yeah. And more revelations about how the bomb did get dropped. Maybe they're going to go back on that. Like that, because that scene was vault saying, we'll drop the bomb ourselves. And in the future, people's like, um, people seem to believe that, or at least Moldover seems to believe that that is indeed what happened, but maybe it doesn't play out that way in season two. If we get more flashbacks. Yeah. Um, I'll be, cause if they do go back on that, that would be interesting. But it's, I mean, the way they reveal that information really makes it seem like, no, this is a permanent change we're making to the law. This is, um, I think I, I said to you after we were talking about this, after the, um, we both finished the show that this plot twist was initially planned for the, um movie that they were going to make based on fallout in mm. i think the script was written in 98 um okay. so this is the original original fallout team so you know people can't even say like oh it's revisionism it's like no this seems to be what the original creators of fallout were, were gunning for um i believe that the film was only cancelled because the studio went under not because of like any creative differences so i might be completely wrong on that um but it, it definitely seems like t- to reveal it so dramatically and like almost staring at maybe literally staying directly at the camera. I can't remember the <laughs> right. scene. Right. <laughs> so I think that's going to stay. And um, I think some yeah. fans won't like that very much. I think you're probably right. I think that will stick just because it was such a big moment. Yeah. Um, when they were spitballing their vaults, did it, did any of those sound familiar? The one about the vacuum robot that they're going to put in charge, that sounded like a real vault, right? Isn't there a vault where they have a... A robot that's in tr- is the overseer. Yes, I believe so. Although, again, I'd have to brush up on my vault yeah. knowledge and also watch. I'd the have scene to again. look them up because they they were saying a lot, and I feel like I heard a few where it sounds like vaguely familiar. Like I think in I think in one of them they were talking about like particular populations to be put in, and I was like, oh, that sounds that sounds like one from whatever game. Um, but I'm sure people will notice like actual ones noticed. They're insane. They're like, one of them's like, we're going to take illegal immigrants and turn them into super mutants. <laughs> and one of them, <laughs> and one of them's like, we're going to separate the kids from their parents so that only the strong children survive. They're just like, I think they're more evil than the ones in the games. <laughs> Which oh, is yeah, saying a lot. They, 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 they'll intentionally overpopulate one so everyone has to like fight for resources. Fight for resources. Like, yeah, just yeah. absolutely mask off. Just 
not even trying to like pretend like what benefit this could have for anyone. It's like that's be evil, right? Because you know, because in the games it feels like it's science. Like it, yeah. like it feels like the experience. Now some of it is social science for sure. Like what is the Dave thing trying to prove? <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> like. But but on the show, a lot of what they're doing is literally for fun. Like literally, somebody goes, "This sounds like a lot of fun." Because <laughs> <laughs> initially they set it up as like, "Oh, this can be," you know, we'll leave it up to this company to put what they think their ideal version of humanity being rebuilt yeah. would be. And it's like h- half of them, like how? Like at that point, you're just right. enjoying human suffering. Like this isn't like yeah. your ideal society. <laughs> Exactly. How is the Torture Olympics going to build a better society? <laughs> yeah. Um. I, I don't know. It's fun. That that whole thing was just fun, I guess. I, I'll be thinking deeply about it for a long time, <laughs> trying to put those pieces together. But maybe if it if it was all for a goof, I think that's OK, too. Um. Is there anything else we should touch on? There's so I mean, there's a lot of stuff we didn't talk about because, like, there's just so much packed into the show. There is, but, um, but I think I'm I'm just so curious to see what everyone thinks about this. Like, we could put this video out, and everyone's like, "Yeah, it's garbage," and we're gonna like go after the writers now. But like, I I really just implore fans to to give it a chance and just go along for the ride, and because and like let them cook because I really just feel like they they understand the messaging, they understand the themes that they're working with, even if facts change, even if like dates are moved around and. Maybe stuff doesn't look how you expected it to look. It's I feel like it's so much more important that they understand uh, the spirit of what was intended with the games, and I would say yeah. they absolutely do. Yeah, I think they absolutely do too. I think it 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 really does capture the essence of what Fallout is in a way that, like, you know, I know people were really harsh on the Resident Evil series. And I think like its big pitfall was how much it just did not feel like Resident Evil. Um, But this does. And it's not just the aesthetic. Like it really, it really does capture what Fallout's all about, even if it's going out on a limb on some pretty big (laughs) ideas. So yeah, I liked it a lot. Uh, I'm way more excited for season two now. Yeah, Um, no, absolutely. So am I. Out of interest, what what would you give it? Five Five out of five. Or not five out of five. Give it a five out of five. Out of five. (laughs) Um, I I think I want to say four point five. I think I think I thought it was pretty brilliant, except for a few things that were super cringe (laughs) and made me want to die. There are some jokes in this thing. I'll point out a couple. The first episode when the massacre is happening, the tone is of the show is not that well established in the first episode. But there's a moment where everyone is getting very brutally massacred and somebody is rolling out a, a jello mold for the for the ceremony the wedding ceremony that was supposed to be happening. And somebody goes, get that jello out of here. And that was like a big joke in that moment that does not land at all. It is so bad. It's so bad. Uh, in the same episode, there's a moment where the, uh, a character is razzing. Uh, Lucy's brother is giving her a hard time because she's in an arranged marriage and she's about to meet her husband to be. And he says, you have no idea who this guy is. He could have a big butt. He could have a small butt. You don't know, which is another joke that does not land at all. There's there's a lot of that through the show where you're just like, why? Why did they write? Was that was the most first like rough draft bit you just had like put joke here in the script and then never filled it in (laughs) there's some pretty rough stuff but that's really the only thing i have to complain about no um i'm I'm pretty much the same um i think i was a little bit more forgiving on like some of the the bad jokes in episode one because i was just kind of in awe of like everything around me i i I Mm. I didn't remember the butt joke i must have just been distracted by looking at how cool the vault looked but i do remember (laughs) the jello one and the jello one was bad (laughs) um but i mean everything else about that scene was great i mean that was that's the moment i fell in love with lucy as a character when i'm watching her beat up a guy in like a 1950s wedding dress like this is my fallout character yes i feel she's badass um so but yeah i think for me it would be either a 4.5 or a 4 uh brought down mostly by um not what they did in the final few episodes but the execution of the final few episodes um but still 
beyond surprised, pleasantly surprised by it, very happy. And I think it more than earns its place in in the world of Fallout. I'm very happy for it to take a role there, even if it's kind of stomping on some stuff that came before it. Right. Yeah. Okay, cool. Right on. Well, that was super fun. Thank you very much. Um, our, our review is linked down in the description if you want to read more of our Fallout thoughts. That's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit that bell, and visit us at thegamer.com. That's the gamer, no space.